Dog evaluation. So this is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts. I guess I'll kick it off by saying we do expect that people do dog evaluations, particularly if you're doing off-leash dog play. So that has always been our standard. So I'll just get that off the plate right away is that I do know and have worked with some facilities that they don't evaluate dogs. So to us, that is not a good best business practice because you really want to make sure that you're bringing in the right dogs for your off-leash play environment. That's probably the starting point is to say mm -hmm. we would actually recommend doing a dog evaluation. And Susan and I both did ours a little bit differently. So I'll just explain the process that I used initially was that we would bring dogs in. We would schedule a specific time for the dog to come in. We would get all their paperwork ahead of time. And we'll talk about the paperwork in a little bit, but we would schedule, have their paperwork, schedule them to come in. We would do a specific time uh, for my evaluations. I had the owners bring the dogs in at a specific time in the morning, usually first thing in the morning. And I always had an extra staff member on hand to help with the evaluations because I still wanted dogs to be managed and monitored what that were in daycare. But then I also needed someone to help with the evaluations. Usually it was me and somebody else. And we did not have the owner stay. And it usually took our evaluation process was usually about 15 to 20 minutes. And after that 15 or 20 minutes, we would usually let the owner know, you know, what our plan was for that dog. 99% of the time it was, they were going to stay there for the rest of the day. So I did charge for the evaluation at that time. It was a nominal fee and that was a non-refundable fee. So that's my process. I am here, but now I'm a blue box. Okay. <laughs> now we can't see you at all. But that's okay. We can that's hear you. Right. So yeah, our evaluations, we did like to have the pet parents attend if they could, because we like to use that as an opportunity to help educate them on canine body language and really what we were looking for as far as behaviors for the dogs that were in our off-leash play groups. We wanted them to understand that every dog that did come into the play groups went through the same evaluation process as well to give them that confidence in what we did. Now, remember Robin and I were doing this back in the pioneer days of dog daycares. It wasn't near as popular, but we did keep that up throughout the time that I owned Urban Tales, which is through 2012. And for us, we did like the fact that the pet parents were there, especially in the event that we didn't think the dog was a good fit for our play groups then talk and the owner had seen the behavior and we would talk to them about some options because we did like to have options for those dogs even if they couldn't come into our play groups but other than that we did introduce dogs one at a time on leash usually at least three if not five and then we would simulate a small group and then we would slowly get them into our bigger play groups and i think the only other thing that I know is pretty common is even though they technically did pass the evaluation, we would really make it clear that the dogs were, we would be giving them constant feedback as far how their dog was doing in the play groups. Cause we wanted dogs there that were really enjoying it and a good fit for play groups. We do get questions from people who ask about can you do the dog evaluation with the owner there? Obviously the way Susan did hers shows that you can do an evaluation with the pet parent in the same room. You do normally have to help the pet parent understand what you want them to do, which means typically you don't want the pet parent to interact with the dog. You want them essentially to stand or sit and ignore their dog. If the dog comes up to the pet parent, you want to let the pet parent know not to pet their dog or talk to their dog. If the dog is really clingy to the pet parent, you may even want that pet parent to stand up and just move away from the dog. So they can obviously be a part of the evaluation, but there are some rules or some guidelines that you should have them pay attention to. And if the dog is getting protective or resource guarding the owner, then it is going to be best to have that owner not be in the room. Somebody asked about evals for dogs with leash reactivity. So that's a great question, Cindy. So what I found with the dogs when I did evaluations, we did do leash evaluations, which means the dog would come in, a new dog would come in. I would have that dog on a leash 
and I would put them in a room by themselves, first of all, so they could check out the room. And then I would have one of my staff members bring a daycare dog in on leash also. So now you have two dogs in the same room, both of them on leash. And then one, within usually 30 to 60 seconds, I would say, okay, I'm comfortable with the daycare dog, take him off leash. I still had the other dog, the new dog on a leash. And then we would bring another dog in, same procedure. So at any given time in the room where I was doing the evaluation, there were dogs, two dogs, the one dog that's being evaluated and then a daycare dog that were on leash. And as they were getting comfortable, I would take the leashes off of the daycare dogs, the normal daycare dogs. And then if I felt comfortable with the dog that was being evaluated, I might drop that leash on the ground. What I found with leash reactivity is, first of all, typically leash reactivity, there's a part of that problem that is a there because of the pet parent. And what, what I mean by that is you can have a dog that's leash reactive only when the pet parent is holding the leash. As soon as we were holding the leash, that reactivity usually went away because there usually is a component of leash reactivity that is partly a combination of things going on actually with the pet parent. So we didn't have a lot of problems with dogs that were leash reactive, but again, it was my staff that was holding the leash. It wasn't the pet parent. If we really had a problem, the way I looked at it is it did give me some ex information. If the dog could not settle down and was leash reactive and just wouldn't settle down at all, I probably don't want that dog in daycare because at some point he is going to be on a leash around other dogs. He might be because I have to move him or because I have to move another dog, whatever. But again, most of the time it wasn't an issue. It was more an issue when the parent had the leash. So hopefully that helps. And the other thing I'll say is, you do have to know your staff, you and your staff have to know how to handle a leash. So the whole time that we're working with the dogs on leash, we were trying to keep the leash loose and not have a lot of tension. You have to be prepared to do that maypole dance because the dogs will start to circle each other and you have to be prepared to hand the leash over or under. So you get really good at that because you the last thing you want to have happen is get the leashes tangled. So that is a little bit of a skill that you have to acquire. But we really didn't have that much of a problem with leash reactivity. All right, there was another question. So Karen was asking, we're getting a lot of puppies. What are the keys for evaluating puppies for open play? The biggest thing that I would look at for puppies, there's actually a couple of things, I guess. One is I'm not too worried about the puppy obviously hurting another puppy. For the most part, puppies are going to do well or they're going to be bullies or they're going to be really fearful. Those are the three categories. I would make sure that your play groups are set up for puppies, meaning that we tend to only want, I only tend to put puppies with other puppies and that's at about four to five months of age and younger. I want them to play with other puppies. I might put them with an adult dog if I am extremely positive that adult dog loves and does well with puppies, which I generally would not take that risk with a dog that I really didn't know that well. So although I usually would put daycare dogs in with other daycare dogs, and I would often use daycare dogs for evaluations, I typically would not test out a daycare dog with puppies unless I knew that dog really well. And I had seen a lot of experience to show me that this dog really likes puppies because puppies can really get messed up. You can mess up a puppy really quickly. So you want to make sure that you're going to the extreme of really doing everything for that puppy to set them up for success. So in terms of puppy play, I look for, really, I, I will just put them with some other puppies and I'll watch to see, do they wanna interact? Are they interested in interacting or are they really scared? And from there, I will adjust what I'm doing with that puppy based on how they're responding. I will also say that for me, puppy play is, the least important thing I think puppies need when they're puppies. So that might be a little bit uh, controversial, but I really don't think that puppies have to play with other puppies. I think if you're gonna do puppy groups, a lot of that puppy group should be exposure to sounds and noises and people with different outfits on and different types of surfaces to walk on. And most importantly, I want puppies to learn how to pay attention to people 
when other puppies are around. So I would actually create a puppy program that includes all of that and isn't just free play all day long with puppies. Cause that's a really good way to just create puppies that are addicted to other puppies, which they already have that tendency. So what I really want to teach them is how to pay attention to people. All right. I guess I'm blue today. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is with that. Susan, do you want to talk about the evaluation process being ongoing? Yes, because we all know that for dogs, the world's either familiar or unfamiliar. So when they're first in your place, and especially if this is the first time that they've ever really been in group play and around other dogs, initially you may not see their true personality because they don't feel comfortable yet because the world is unfamiliar, which is a big reason why when we do an evaluation, it's giving the pet parent feedback on how their dog did and then telling them that we will continue to provide updates as they come. I also think that it's important that if you see things that concern you in the dog's behavior or even in the background you get, that you're not sure that they're going to be a long-term good fit in your play groups, I would open the door to that conversation right away. For whatever reason, in our groups, like, we never had bull terriers be successful beyond about nine months of age. So if I had done an evaluation with a bull terrier, then we may explain that. Or if we had a very dog who started daycare older than say five or six, and they seem to be a little hesitant, I would be telling them the pet parents at the day of the evaluation that technically things went all right, but we need to see them in groups to see if long-term this was going to be a good fit. Because the goal is to have dogs enjoying play groups, and you do find some dogs age out, or some dogs can grow into behaviors that become inappropriate for your groups. Yeah, we talked a little bit at one of our prior Facebook lives about the starting point for your facility is to uh, write out and make sure everybody on your team knows what are the appropriate behaviors you want from dogs in whatever activities you're doing and what are the inappropriate behaviors because that's how you want to talk to your pet parents if you have a dog that doesn't work out well in your daycare you can say here's the reason why these are the behaviors we're looking for and these are the behaviors your dog's showing and those aren't a fit. And it doesn't necessarily have to be aggression. Like ev when I talk about that, everyone thinks we don't want dogs that are growling and snapping, which you don't. But <laughs> although some of that is normal communication for dogs, but obviously we don't want a ton of that, but there could be other things. So for my facility, I didn't want to see dogs that were showing stress behaviors by doing repetitive behaviors. And one of my dogs that I had, we, at one point, one of my facilities was on a railroad track, like not literally on it, but just <laughs> right behind the facility was a railroad track. So we, several times a day, we had trains drive by my facility and most of the dogs could care less, but I did have one dog that when a train was getting ready to come by, he would start spinning and I didn't want that behavior to continue. So that's a behavior. That's one of those things that I would say, that's an inappropriate behavior. I don't want to see that type of behavior in my facility. So we worked with that dog to actually distract him when trains were coming and that worked, but had that not have worked, we would have not kept the dog in daycare. Cause I don't want that kind of a stereotype behavior to start and then possibly continue. Same thing with my facility. A lot of the herding breeds in my one facility that was smaller, a lot of the herding breeds didn't do well there because there just wasn't enough room for them. And so they would just start to run the outer edges of the room. And again, that was just not a behavior I wanted to see. So the, when I'm saying appropriate versus inappropriate behaviors, it doesn't necessarily have to be aggression. We didn't want dogs that were jumping on them and scratching them and just had no manners or no boundaries. We That was inappropriate behavior. So for those dogs, we would often recommend them into a training program before they would come into daycare or do both training and daycare together to see if that could resolve the the problem of them jumping up and just like scratching and not because they were intending to hurt, just because they had no manners. So that inappropriate versus appropriate behaviors, it's important to outline those and decide what you want for those. And then we do talk a lot about having multiple activities for dogs for a whole lot of reasons. One is just because you can offer more revenue streams, but also because then when you're doing that evaluation, it's not about pass or fail, the dog 
can come to daycare or can't. It's really an evaluation to say, we're going to evaluate your dog and see what your dog likes. And then we'll tell you which of our four programs are a best fit. One of those programs might be daycare. One of them might be a nature walk by themselves or massage or whatever. So being able to talk to the clients ahead of time to say, this evaluation is all about finding out what your dog likes. It then takes away the whole conversation of, did my dog pass or did my dog not pass? And then you, it's a lot more of a negative conversation. If you have to come out and say, your dog failed the evaluation, (laughs) there's just no nice way to say that. So having the ability to say, and you set that up from the beginning, when you set up your evaluation process to say, we're just going to see what your dog likes the best. And then you approach the owner with that sense of helping them figure out what their dog would really like to do is a, a lot better. For those of you that joined us late, we, Susan is here. She's just a blue box at the moment, but <laughs> her internet is acting wonky. Michaela had said, is there a certain leash that you would recommend? So I typically in my evaluations, I just used a leather. I prefer leather because I think it's easier to handle and it was a snap leash. So it was one that I would clip on the dogs. So that was what I used in Moving dogs around in our facility, we did use kennel leads, which are just slip leads, but I typically did not use a slip lead to do evaluations because I didn't want them tightening the way a slip lead will tighten if a dog pulls on it. So I usually would just use a regular collar, uh, nylon or leather collar, and then a leather leash. I don't know, Susan, if you used anything different. No, leather leashes, six foot leather leashes was what we used. ours, Ours were six feet as well. So Josette had asked, are these practices on video? We do actually have a course, a dog evaluations course. So we do have videos in that course. And you can see that on our website that you can look at. And that's at thedoggerers.com forward slash store. And in there is there is a dog evaluation. In our library, if you're a member of our membership site, which is the library, we do have some case studies in there as well that show evaluations. And if you're with Pet Guru College, you also have the library as well. So we have um, some there as well. So Julia said, how do you know when the dog is ready to start group play? Do you want to talk about that one, Susan? Yeah, I don't, I know you were talking about puppies. And so we, I don't know if she's thinking in terms of age or behavior. So we'll talk about both. As far as age, we didn't like to put our puppies into adult play groups until Typically, they were about six months of age, just because of the intensity of play being different and puppies needing to learn other things more importantly than being with other dogs during those first few months. And then we didn't necessarily, like it was a six-month-old lab, it may not go with the body slammer group where typically we would have labs. We would have a more mellow group because we we're really sensitive to the level of play and intensity of a play that we put dogs in that were less than a year. And we would rotate and give our puppies more rest up through nine months and maybe even a year. So I think for younger dogs, you need to really look at behavior and their emotional growth. Dogs, other dogs, as far as behavior, you want to see the relaxed postures. You want to see them feeling like they're engaging, that they're not just wallflowers or trying to hide. Although we did like to have places where dogs could get away and take breaks from the group. But it is all about the behavior and the body language that you're observing. And you just want to see mostly green without the stress signals. Yeah. And a couple of things, when I talked earlier about before I did evaluations, I wanted the paperwork from the owner. So we did have an evaluation form that we filled out that the owner filled out. And there were some red flags that I was looking for on that form. Cause what my goal was, if I didn't think a dog was going to do well, I didn't even want them to come in for the evaluation. Cause then I just didn't have to deal with the whole scenario of why I wasn't going to keep the dog. And at that point, I really only did do daycare. Today, if I was doing it again, I would have an option for dogs that didn't do well in off-leash play. But at the time I was doing evaluations at my facility, I did I only offered daycare. So if they didn't do daycare, it was a lot harder. I did refer them to other services and other people in my area that offered services that might work. But if I 
thought that they weren't going to work out, then I would have that conversation usually on the phone ahead of time and talk them out of coming. <laughs> but some of the things that I would look for in terms of whether or not I thought a dog was ready, I want to know the age of the dog and why the owner wants to bring them for off-leash play. And age of the dog is important because if it's a dog that's over about three years old and the owner is bringing them in for socialization, if that's what they tell you, why? like we had a question, why do you want to bring your dog in? If they said the dog is three and I need him to be socialized, that's an immediate red flag. What does that mean? It usually means the dog is having issues somewhere, usually at the dog park or in the neighborhood where he's fighting with other dogs or showing aggression towards other dogs. That is normally the reason that an owner will, of an adult dog will say their dog needs socialization. I have to bring them to play group. Those are not really the dogs that I want in an off-leash environment. If you have a behavior modification program where you're actually modifying a dog's behavior to where they can accept or tolerate being around other dogs, that dog might be a good fit for you. But for 99.9% .9 of the facilities that we work with, off-leash play is for dogs that enjoy the company of other dogs. It's not a place where you're teaching them to tolerate other dogs. And there's a big distinction there. So I don't, if a dog is already having issues in the neighborhood that I want to find that out from the pet parent. So I would ask a few more questions. What do you mean by socialization? Oh, and then you usually get, oh, hey, he sometimes growls at dogs at the dog park or sometimes snaps at them or whatever. So that's a totally different dog and a totally different program that I would put them in. If they're a puppy, if they say he needs socialization and the dog's four or five months, that makes a lot more sense. So I might bring them in at a younger age for socialization. But like Susan said, that, that would be a totally separate program. That would be a puppy program specifically for puppies. I think then it just really does come into looking at the dog's behavior. I would prefer dogs that have been playing with a lot of other dogs their, all their life to get a feel for whether or not they might do well in an off-leash play environment. Some owners will tell you their dog plays with, they, their dog plays a ton and loves to play with other dogs. And then when you say, how many other dogs have they played with? They'll, they say, oh, the neighbor next door, the dog next door. So like he played a lot with one dog. <laughs> so that, again, that doesn't mean if that's an adult dog, it doesn't mean that he's gonna wanna play with a whole bunch of dogs that he's never met before but he might do really well with the dog next door. So you have to ask some of those questions, but then it ultimately, it comes down to bringing that dog in and watching their body language. And I will say Susan and I are very adamant that daycare is for dogs that are really enjoying it. So you're looking the whole time at, is this dog having fun in this environment? And if they're not, the question is not, how do we make them like it? The question is what other activity can you provide to that dog? Because that's just a better way of dealing with that whole scenario. Our goal really is not just dogs tolerating being in a group with other dogs. We want dogs that are there that are having fun. Cindy said, do you consider herding breeds, the foot nipping of a herding breed bad, inappropriate when other dogs are running? This would go down to how do the other dogs feel about it? So we're always looking at body language and enjoyment. So I would be looking at the body language of the dogs that are being nipped. And in my experience, most dogs did not really enjoy that. So I would consider that an inappropriate behavior if the dogs that are being nipped displayed the body language I would expect from them doing that. Yes, I'm not sure group play and indoors, especially play areas, are really good for some of the intense herding dogs, which was one reason we would refer those to one of our competitors who had like acre play yards. The, some of the herding breeds did better there. And that's just what I found. Yeah. And some, sometimes you can redirect them to get them to do something else, but if they're really obsessed about it, then it, it usually is not fun for the other dog. So you really have to find an outlet for that dog to do something to get it. Sometimes you can just give that dog an energy outlet in another way and then bring them back to group play. And then sometimes they'll get the edge taken off of them and they play, they play better, but it really does depend on whether or not you can redirect them. And I do find for a lot of the indoor facilities that becomes a problem with the herding breeds. And that was the same problem that we had as well with the indoor facility. And I will say that when Susan and I had our facilities, for me, dogs over eight, I generally 
discourage them from coming because of, I didn't have a lot of, I had two main rooms and I really didn't have a room where I could put the older dogs. A lot of times those older dogs end up with the small dogs. So you'll have all these under 25 pound dogs, and then you'll have the 10 year old lab or whatever in that same room. And that might work, but I will tell you that now, and now we are seeing more and more of a desire for that sort of a senior room or geriatric dog room. So that's a huge niche that you can actually fill where you essentially set up a really nice plush, comfortable room for dogs that are older. A lot of pet parents do want to have their dog get some activity if they're getting out of the house for something. A lot of times older dogs have more problems with incontinence. So sometimes owners who have to be gone for a while and don't want to crate their dog, an older dog that long are looking for an outlet. So it's a great market to touch on and do a whole, just like you could do a whole program for puppies, you could do a whole program just for those senior dogs or less active dogs. So definitely don't rule that out as a revenue stream as well. Jan had said, when you're just starting out, what do you do about evaluator dogs? Great, that is definitely a challenge. And what you can do is you probably have friends or family that may have dogs that you can use. You're looking for even temperament dogs, adults, probably between three to six, I would say, are probably good evaluator dogs. And even some potential early clients, you can use their dogs. And we did use client dogs in our evaluations, but we had a very formal process that we went through. And not every dog is a good evaluator dog. You will find that some dogs just really do love meeting other dogs and doing evaluations, and some dogs are just not good at it. Sheppy, my chow mix, he absolutely loved being an evaluator dog. So you, that's what you're looking for is a stable temperament and that you can read their body language. They'll bring behaviors out of other dogs and they won't necessarily react is what you're looking for. Yeah, and we do, we also get the question all the time of if you're going to use daycare dogs as your evaluator dogs, do you have to get permission from the owner? Mm -hmm. And I never did. I used daycare dogs as my evaluator dogs all the time once I got open. Initially, I used my own dog and then one or two of my friends' dogs. But as Susan mentioned, you do want to find a dog that enjoys the role of evaluator dog, and not every dog does like that. But then, and that was also why once I got opened, I did rotate my evaluator dogs. I didn't always use the same one or two dogs because it is it can be exhausting for those dogs. So I wanted to rotate that. So I would use dogs from daycare and I never talked specifically to the owners about it because the fact that their dog is in daycare, they are they already realize their dog's gonna be meeting new dogs. So I usually would let them know as a because they usually took great pride knowing their dog was the evaluator dog for that day, but I didn't tell them as a way of getting their permission beforehand. So that question comes up a lot as well. But you really do want to watch to make sure that dog is enjoying the process, is not avoiding the other dogs, and is really happy to be the evaluator dog, I think. And then I would definitely reward those dogs as well. So extra treats and toys and pets for those dogs after they're done with the evaluation process. And usually our evaluation process that one-on-one -on -one introduction would happen the first time. Once a dog had been evaluated, then we did not put them through another evaluation, but we would do slow introductions. Usually we'd put them in the double gated area for, and this was for every dog that was coming in and allow all the dogs to settle down We would before we would let them in the room. But once they were, once they had that initial evaluation, we had, didn't really go back to doing that on a daily basis. So uh, documenting the process and talking to the clients about it, you do want to make sure that you have the communication, an open communication with your pet parents. So if your pet parents are there watching the whole process, I would be explaining to them in as non-technical terms as possible what you're doing and why and what you're seeing with the dog without being excessively negative. So you always want to make sure that you're putting things in a way that you're helping the owner to understand it without 
making them feel bad as well. So that can be a little bit delicate sometimes, but even if they're not there afterwards, whether it's right after the evaluation or when the owner comes to pick the dog up or whatever, you do want to talk a little bit about what you saw. And I usually couch that in really helping the owner understand what their dog really likes and what would be great for their dog, what, whether the owner, whether the dog seemed to like being with other dogs and if so, which ones in terms of size and age and that kind of thing. Or if the dog really didn't like being with other dogs, then I would couch it in. He loves one-on-one -on -one attention. He loves doing tricks with the staff. He loves being out in nature or playing fetch or whatever. So you're telling them in a positive way, what activities you feel like the dog would do best in. If there are what I will say negative things to say, I would tell them about that, but maybe not right at the evaluation. If it's not if it's not life-threatening, if it's not like a situation where if the owner doesn't know this one bad thing about her dog right now, something's bad going to happen. <laughs> if that wasn't the scenario, then I would just wait and have that conversation after you build up a bit, a bit more of a relationship with that pet parent so that you can help them to build your trust before you start saying, oh, your dog has this problem and that problem and all that. So that was how I approached those that communication. I don't know, Susan, if you had any other thoughts on just communicating with the pet parents. Yeah, I think it's very important to be, like you said, open and honest, but again, giving them the information that's important at the time for the services until you build up that trust. And I think the key thing is making sure that they understand that you do like their dog, that their dog is still a great family pet, even if you can't play with other dogs. I think there's too much pressure put on that and that there's something wrong with either the family or the dog if they can't be in group play, which is why, as you talked earlier, we like setting up an evaluation more as an assessment of what the dog likes versus that pass fail for playing with other dogs. Because, and I think if you can do analogies that people understand, like I am not one that really loves to go to big cocktail parties, but I enjoy sitting around with a few friends as Robin is when we were traveling and in hotels, I would much prefer to go back to the hotel room and hang out with five or six close friends than to go to the bar and be around a group of 30 people. And dogs are the same way. And I think if you can use analogies that people can relate to, Human-wise, it's a way to explain some of these things to pet parents where they understand it without having to get technical. Julia asked, do you have breed restrictions or do you evaluate all dogs? So this is a great question. I would recommend evaluating all dogs. And this goes back to that idea of having appropriate versus inappropriate play behaviors. What are the behaviors you want to see in the dogs in your care? And if you talk about it that way, it takes away the whole breed conversation. And the reason that's helpful is because you don't get labeled as, oh, she just doesn't, Akitas or Dobermans or name your breed. Like it could be any breed. But rather than talking about the breed itself, talk about the behaviors they're showing and whether or not they fit your model for these are the behaviors we want to see. These are behaviors we don't want to see. So that gets you out of the whole breed restriction conversation. I also don't particularly think breed restrictions work very well. I don't think it's a really good label because in every breed, yes, there are some stereotypes and there's there dogs that are bred to do certain things, but in every within every breed, you'll see wide variation. So I had we had a chow that came to our daycare. I never would have thought chows you think of them as not social and not really playful with other dogs. This dog, I, he did not read his breed description. We used to joke because he was the most social chow on the face of the earth. He was just super social, loved every dog, loved people. And I would have hated to not have the opportunity to have seen him and played with him and got to know him as family just because of a breed restriction. And same thing with other dogs who might be super social, but in that particular breed, they aren't, they don't want to play. So I just, I like to say, just evaluate all the dogs and then talk to the pet parents about the particulars you're seeing in that dog. Just an easier way to go after that. 
Um, and then Christy also had asked good phrases to use instead of your dog is aggressive. So do you want to talk about that, Susan? I think you can more describe what you're seeing if they're uncomfortable. And I guess it depends on what you've seen. You may want to say, like, I had a smooth collie who was very space sensitive. And so she might snap when dogs got too close into her space. So I would do more of a description of the actual behaviors you're seeing that might think some people would say are aggressive and then go to the emotional state that you're seeing as a result of that, either in your dog, in their dog or the other dogs. Yeah. And the other challenge with saying your dog is aggressive is that it's not aggressive all the time. Even people who really do have dogs that show aggressive behaviors, like they, they have a known dog that will bite. They will usually describe their dog as perfectly fine 95% of the time. And then there's 5% of the time when it shows aggressive behaviors. So that whole idea of your dog is aggressive is not the dog is always aggressive 100% of the time. It's the, it is, as Susan said, it's very specific to a situation. It's very specific to what, who or what is around the dog. So just getting out of the, your dog is aggressive and describing the behavior is going to be a lot better and a lot easier. The other thing that we have found is I generally, as a general rule, I will generally not talk about a dog in negative terms when the dog is there. And what I mean by that is if you're going to have to tell an owner, like your dog has X, Y, Z issues, and we're going to need to do something special with your dog, whether it's referring it to a trainer or referring it to a behaviorist or just dismissing it from a program. I like to do that when the dog's not there. It's a lot easier for the owner to have a conversation with you. And if I'm going to show them or describe to them what the dog is doing, I will usually use pictures that are of another dog. And this, this is something I learned a long time ago. If you show them, this is part of why we ended up creating posters and visual guides, because you want to have pictures of the dogs of a different dog snarling or a different dog doing humping behavior or whatever it is. It's a lot easier for an owner to grasp it when you show them a dog that is not theirs and you say, this is what we're seeing in your dog. Now, at some point you might need to have video footage or whatever, it might be a helpful, but I just find that initial conversation, if it is going down a path of negative, what the owner is going to perceive as negative behaviors or dog is doing, that conversation is a lot easier to do with not when you don't have the dog there, because you're not staring at the dog, <laughs> saying bad things about it, and you're showing the owner pictures of another dog doing it, whether you just find a magazine, a book, whatever, you can find all kinds of pictures of dogs doing stuff. But I find that's an easier conversation, at least initially. If you have to take safety precautions with a dog during or after the evaluation, would you tell the owner about that? So that's a really good question. I would say yes, I would absolutely let the owner know if I had to take safety precautions. And then I also think you have to go back to what are the protocols for your facility. I know some facilities that will take dogs that have issues and they have safety protocols in place for those dogs. And then I've seen other places that say if the dog requires this type of safety precaution, we aren't going to take them at all. So I do think you have to set that policy for your facility. I know some facilities that will not take dogs that have a bite history or will not take dogs that have any kind of aggression issues. And then I know other facilities that will. So you have to decide that first of all, but absolutely. If I have to take safety precautions, I do want the owner to know about that. Yeah. And then Cindy said, my German shepherd is space reactive, but not aggressive. So yeah, space and resource guarding and any dog, sometimes you'll have dogs that are considered what we sometimes refer to as cage brave, where they're they only will growl or snarl if they're in an enclosure and somebody walks by, but open the door and they're perfectly fine. There's a lot of those scenarios out there. And that is part of understanding how to manage dogs like that, deciding if you want, whether or not you want those dogs in your facility. And again, some will say yes, some will say no. And that's the great thing about owning your own business. You can <laughs> decide those for yourself and be perfectly happy with whichever decision that you decide. But you do have to also train your staff how to manage dogs like that or how to help change the environment for dogs when they're in a situation like that. Because again, that's a perfect example, Cindy, of your German Shepherd. 
is not aggressive. Your German Shepherd does not like to be enclosed in a small space. And if they do, there's, and that's perfectly normal for a lot of dogs. If you don't give them a lot of options, we talk about fight and flight. When a dog gets overwhelmed or an animal gets overwhelmed, if you're in a tiny enclosed space, you just took away their flight option. So what other option do they have? So that is part of why we sometimes will see dogs that are bark or lunge when they're in an enclosed space. So you do have to understand that how to prevent that and then how to work with that if it happens. So I think all of that is part of just understanding the body language, which I guess the other thing we can talk about really quickly, Susan, is what would you uh, recommend for the facility or the evaluator to have in place in terms of knowledge that they should have before they do an evaluation? I guess another way of saying that is how, who should be doing the evaluations in any facility? I would have your most experienced and best um, observers of body language and behavior. So for us, it was a role, the lead evaluator anyway, was our more experienced staff, possibly the daycare supervisor, manager, or lead who had been with us a long time. They need to understand dog behavior and body language, as well as the components and makeup of your play groups and knowing which dogs to pull for specific applicant dogs, as well as then how the dog will fit into your play group. So I think in the best world, they've got knowledge of both. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest a step up in terms of a promotion or looking at a career path for your team members is they need to have a, they need to have a strong foundation in canine body language before you're going to ask them to do any kind of evaluation. And this is part of why with knowing dogs program, for those of you that have used that, they, we often get the question of where's the knowing dogs on evaluations. And it's not part of knowing dogs for a reason, because knowing dogs is the basic foundation that your staff needs to be safe around dogs for knowing dogs 101, understand stress signals, understand basic canine body language. And then for knowing dogs 201, understanding how to use all that information to manage off-leash play groups. That's the foundation. So the next step of that would be then getting them to start watching and um, shadowing someone who's doing the evaluations and learning that whole process. Cause it is a totally different set of information that you're having to make assessments on and you have to do it relatively quickly. So you want them to have a really strong foundation before you ask that staff member to start doing evaluations, which is why we have it as a separate sort of a leadership step up program, the way we look at it. Susan and I did put together a daycare summary standard, which is basically a free PDF download that you can get and just it goes through what we would consider minimum standards for operating a safe daycare. There's no organization that has come out and said in terms of government or whatever, like these are the standards that every daycare has to follow. Obviously we're an unregulated industry, but we do, Susan and I have done this long enough. We do believe there are best practices and that's what's in our daycare summary standard. So you can download that for free. I put the link in there. Cindy asked, do you do timeouts for crabby tired pups? I'll let you talk about that, Susan. Yeah, we would do what we call rest periods. Absolutely. We would do rest periods. And some dogs we would recommend maybe only stay in group play for half a day. When I think of timeouts, we did timeouts, but we did that more for behavior modification. So a timeout was a very short time period, maybe a minute or less away from the group. But we definitely use rest periods, not only for puppies, but for dogs that were having a bad behavior day and some dogs we did find did better only half days versus full days. Absolutely. Yeah. And for, as Susan mentioned, for puppies under really eight, nine months, like younger puppies, I would build into your program more rest for them right off the bat, especially puppies that are four months and under, they should have a significant amount of rest. I would say over half of those puppies day should be resting one last question and then we'll wrap up. So Karen said she has a six month old intact male, very friendly, but is constantly humping and does not leave others alone. We tried distraction, removing him from the group, et cetera. 
I would so, probably find some mental engagement for that dog and not let him practice those behaviors. He would be great for an enrichment type environment. Yeah, I would look be looking at, I would actually be looking at that as some type of in potential insecurity more than like domination. A lot of people think that dogs hunt because they're trying to prove who's boss. I'm actually, and I do think that is one reason potentially that a dog might hump that do that behavior. That usually looks much different though. It's usually much more assertive. It's usually much, the body language of the dog is usually much more stiff, the closed mouth and all that. But I think the majority of times that I see younger dogs doing the humping behavior, it's more an insecure dog who's, I don't really know what else to do. This seems like I should do this. And they're just a little clueless or they're just high arousal dogs and they just can't, they just don't know what to do with all their energy, which is again, like Susan said, putting that's a perfect candidate for a dog that is, should be put in some type of an enrichment based program rather than just a free play we're not going to do anything with you and just think about what you want to do kind of program. So I would definitely look like, look at that too. So she said he's a French bulldog and they do, they have a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So other, another thing that we sometimes did with dogs is just, if you get a dog, that's just really high energy. And when they come into the room, they're just over the top it is sometimes doing exercise with those dogs before you let them into daycare. So whether it's 10 minutes on a treadmill or the owner takes them for a walk before they come into daycare, or you take them in and then immediately take them out and throw a ball for them, whatever, like getting some of that energy outlet out of the dog before you put them into group, into play group. And I, if you have to do that kind of thing, I would charge extra for it by the way, but sometimes that can help, but otherwise it just may be a dog that needs more guidance and more direction. Joshua said, catering to individual needs can be challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I said I would charge for it. So anytime you have to do anything for an individual dog, then I would add a, an extra amount to that client's bill because it is going to take more time for your staff. So I wouldn't just do that because it it's what you need to do. Or And then again, if you can't offer that type of one-on-one -on -one attention, then referring that dog out to some another facility where they can cater more to that dog's needs. And that might be the case too. So I would say, look at both of those options. I think that the key thing is you don't have to take every dog. As Robin said, you're the owner doing your behavior list, what you want to see, create the environment that's right for you and your team. So we're empowering you to make those decisions.